Greetings folks, I'm Rob Machado and I'd like to introduce you to my How to Fly an Airplane e-course. This 15-hour video-based and highly animated e-course is designed to do the one thing that other flying e-courses don't do, and that is to provide you with a deep understanding of how we control an airplane in the air and while landing. Now, there are several similar e-courses that do a wonderful job at showing you an airplane in flight performing the maneuvers required to become a licensed private pilot. However, what's often missing from these courses is a presentation of the aileron rudder elevator and throttle skill set required to perform these maneuvers, thus the reason for this e-course. In this course, I'll show you the precise control movements needed to perform the basic and advanced flight maneuvers required for private pilot certification. And I'll explain why the controls are manipulated in a certain way to achieve the desired outcome. In short, the skills and understanding you'll acquire from this course will allow you to accelerate your learning progress during flight training. So let's take a quick look at a few highlights from this e-course to help you better understand its contents. Keep in mind that in slow flight near stall speed, the airplane might be operating on the back side of the power curve, also known as the region of reversed command. In many small airplanes, the region of reversed command typically begins at approximately 20% or less above stall speed. And that means that if your airplane stalls at 40 knots and you're flying at 48 knots, 20% above stall speed, then you're probably entering the region of reversed command. In this region, an increase in pitch attitude results in a descent or a faster descent rate unless you immediately increase power to hold altitude. The nose is below the horizon because you're descending and turning. Any increase in elevator back pressure doesn't entirely translate into the vertical movement of the nose because of the banked condition. When observing the airplane's pitch attitude in relation to the horizon, it might not be apparent to you that the wings are approaching their critical angle of attack when applying elevator back pressure in a descending turn. To recover from a stall in a descending turn, you must do what you did before, but now it's a lot more counterintuitive because the nose is already below the horizon and the ground is close. Here is where you want to stay true to your school. It's just a stall. Release elevator back pressure and lower the nose, reducing the angle of attack to less than its critical value. You know that when stalling an airplane in uncoordinated flight, the wing opposite the direction of the skid or slip, think opposite the direction of ball deflection here, drops at the moment of stall, followed by the airplane yawing and rolling, then pitching downward. Most people's gut reaction is to use the control linked to that thing that's gone wrong to try to make it right. But if you use the ailerons to try and raise the dropping wing, you'll deepen the stall on that wing and accelerate the airplane's rolling motion, further exacerbating the spin condition. So remember the rudder. What you need to do without further ado is to use rudder to prevent the lowered wing from further yawing and rolling. Of course, you must simultaneously reduce the angle of attack too. Now we come to a ground reference maneuver that's essentially a turn around a point on a half shell or two. It's the same maneuver but sliced in half and set side by side. The physical objective of this maneuver is to fly half circles of equal radii along a straight ground reference such as road, fence, or field border at 600 to 1,000 feet above ground level. The educational objective of this maneuver is to teach you how an airplane's radius is affected by both the airplane's bank angle and the wind's speed and direction. Don't move. How a stationary spot on the ground shows where you're headed. With the airplane trimmed for approach speed and the descent rate constant, as you look through your windscreen, there will always be one single spot on the ground directly ahead of you that doesn't appear to move. It's the spot where your airplane is headed, assuming that the glide path doesn't change, of course. All objects on the surface positioned above the stationary spot and thus beyond the point where the glide path intercepts the runway appear to move up 
away from that stationary spot as you get closer. Those below the stationary spot appear to move down and away from that spot. The points above and below the stationary spot appear to move away because the entire surface picture in your windscreen is getting bigger. Look at the center of any picture hanging on a wall while moving closer to the center of that picture. The center remains stationary while the upper and lower parts of the picture appear to move up and down away from the center. We call this technique for evaluating your glide path the stationary spot method. Now, after turning on to final approach, I don't want you to look for the spot on the ground that isn't moving. Instead, I want you to look at the spot where you'd like to land, your desired landing spot, and see whether or not it's moving up or down relative to your windscreen. If the spot where you'd like to land remains stationary in your windscreen, then that's where you're headed, and good for you. As a final note on slips, keep in mind that a slip begins with a slip, not a skid. That's why it's always best to initiate a slip with aileron usage first, followed by rudder. Aileron application banks the airplane and yaws the nose in the opposite direction of the turn, which fits the technical definition of a slip. As the nose yaws, the appropriate amount of opposite rudder pressure is added to either perform a forward or a side slip. Some pilots start their slips by applying rudder first and induce a temporary skid before the slip. Now this is a very poor technique because it's dangerous if performed too close to the wing's critical angle of attack. After all, a skid at the moment of a stall is how you enter a spin. So apply aileron pressure, then follow it with the appropriate application of rudder. The Runway Expansion Effect Hello folks, Rod Machado here. What if I could show you how to identify when to begin the round out and flare for landing in a way that doesn't rely on depth perception? Have I got your attention? <laughs> Good. Let's discuss the technique that we'll call the Runway Expansion Effect. As we learned in an earlier video, when you approach the runway in a stabilized descent, its trapezoidal shape appears to grow in the windscreen. The rate of growth, however, isn't linear. It turns out that the width of the runway near your selected landing spot appears to expand geometrically in the windscreen with the largest amount of growth occurring when you're 8 to 10 seconds from touchdown. In fact, during the period from 12 seconds to 8 seconds prior to touchdown, the runway width at your selected landing spot appears to expand 10 times in size. Looking at the runway lateral expansion versus time to touchdown graph, you can see how the rate of runway expansion is the largest when you are 8 to 10 seconds away from touching down. And this expansion also occurs at a point where the airplane is typically around 10 feet above the landing surface. Said another way, the runway dramatically widens in your windscreen right at the point where you should typically begin the round out followed by the landing flare. Now that is very convenient. 